our picks for the top 10 action films of all time. Part 2. It's pretty much impossible to talk about action movie style, especially as far as Hollywood is concerned, without a serious look at its golden age. The 80s and 90s saw the newly formed Hollywood tentpole machine pour a never-before-seen energy into the creation of ever-bigger, ever-crazier, testosterone-fueled shoot-'em-ups that launched the increasingly muscular action star careers of Mel Gibson, Bruce Willis, Chuck Norris, Sly Stallone, and Arnold Schwarzenegger. These decades and their seemingly insatiable taste for sweat-beaded biceps carrying absurdly-sized machines Machine Guns brought us the ridiculous likes of Robocop, True Lies, Total Recall, Tango and Cash, Con Air, Point Break, Big Trouble in Little China, Predator, First Blood, They Live, Top Gun, Running Man, Demolition Man, The Freakin' Rock, and on and on and on. But if there is one best of the bunch, one crowning achievement of the entire 20-year period where Hollywood's ammo budget rivaled the armies, God help us if it isn't motherfucking Die Hard. So much energy has been spent singing the praises of what may be the most iconic film in the Hollywood action canon, and for good reason. The film is structurally perfect. It balances its heaviness with its levity with grace, and manages all its ballistic chaos without ever seeming excessive. John McClane is built with bottomless competence and an endearing vulnerability, a rare combination amongst his cohorts in the era. And then there's the villain. Every single detail of the film fits perfectly amidst the others, advances the action precisely, and is also communicated with perfection, which, if you saw our last installment, is an important piece of subtle praise that is rarer than gold. Awesomeness fills seats, awesomeness is easy. Maintaining sense and coherence while blowing our minds with the newest, coolest set piece? Over and over, that's enough to get you in the history books. And if you've got some of the genre's best characters at the same time, well, you might just be diehard. Hollywood wasn't the only national cinema going through its heyday in the 80s and 90s. Just as important and influential, and maybe even a little bit more insane, was the appetite for action in Hong Kong. Coming on the heels of the 70s kung fu new wave that saw the Shaw Brothers and Bruce Lee launch the regional cinema into the international spotlight. The 80s and 90s brought us Jackie Chan and Jet Li and Donnie Yen and Sue Hark and Yoon Woo Ping and Johnny Toe and so much more. Here we find Police Story and Super Cop, and City on Fire, and Tiger Cage, and A Hero Never Dies. But nobody's work exemplified and emblemized the egregiously violent excesses of the era like the step-print, dove-flying, bullet ballistics of John Woo. His entire pre-Hollywood career is a catalog of ever-improving balls-to-the-wall ballistics and saxophone, from A Better Tomorrow to Just Heroes, The Killer, and Bullet in the Head. But he really topped himself and everyone else in the entire world with his career high-water mark hard-boiled. Hardboiled starts in the tea house and ends in the hospital, bookending itself with two of the best, most Hong Kongiest, most John Wooiest sequences this side of the killer's church finale. And it's no tea party in between them either. The film is chock full of Wu's signature tropes hard drinking, jazz listening, brooding cops who dual wield pistols as birds flap in slow mo, jumping from cover to unleash never ending clips before engaging in gun fu. And in the two cops team up to take down bad guys plot, we just want to make sure you all either learn or remember that Chow Yun-Fat's sax-playing hero character is named Tequila. We think that says quite a lot.
In the aftermath of two decades that saw action production numbers crash back down to Earth as the various bubbles pop, it seems to us that from the ashes, three distinct aesthetic trends in the genre have emerged. The first seems like the simplest outgrowth of Last Millennium's excess, a style that leans into the humor and insanity permitted by the increasingly bonkers conflicts that audiences had learned to enjoy. This is the over-the-top action trend. Increasingly invincible heroes take on increasingly impossible obstacles in increasingly suicidal ways. The set pieces are ever bigger, focuses on the novel and new in stunt and vehicle and CGI work, and there's a progressive sense of, oh no they won't, oh yes they did. Movies like Total Recall and Desperado gave way to modern action insanity like those in the later Fast and Furious franchise, and in Crank, and the John Wicks. John Woo comes to America and makes Face Off. Robert Rodriguez gives us Sin City. We find more explicit parodies of the decades past in films like The Expendables and Shoot 'em Up. But as far as contemporary excess in action is concerned, our favorite belongs to a loving send up slash homage slash ripoff slash evolution that seems to operate on a never enough ethos from our very own Quentin Tarantino, The Kill Bills. <laughs> Kill Bill sits at the excess nexus of all things both awesome and extra as an exploitation kung fu samurai spaghetti western animation revenge extravaganza. Where else but in this action epic in two parts can you find one on 80 bloodbaths, chain mace duels, insanely campy training sequences, multiple eye plucks, and one of the most badass action heroes this side of the Pacific. Tarantino managed to funnel all of the best parts of his signature reference everything, steal everything, mock everything else style into a loving elevation of all the extremes of decades past. Nearly every fight sequence contains a new form of craziness, the choreography comes from the very best, there's hardly a top it doesn't go over, and that's exactly how something like this should be. Seemingly reacting against the absurdity of the over-the-top trend, a perpendicular aesthetic has also developed. Probably most familiarly described as gritty and realistic, this kind of action film was best typified and popularized by the Bourne trilogy. Here, the focus moves from bigger is better to finding the intensity in the intimate. Camera work is more likely handheld than swooping on a crane. Heroes are more likely flawed or past their prime, or at least a little fallible. Wounds and consequences seem more dire, and knives become a renewed threat whereas before, bazookas and fighter planes had almost lost their danger. Here we find modern greats like Drive, Eastern Promises, Taken, Hannah, The Elite Squad films, Collateral, Atomic Blonde, and Man From Nowhere. Even the Bond films, forever dedicated to the sillier side of things, took a detour more towards this sort of action with the introduction of the Daniel Craig Bond. However, we think the best film inside this category actually predates pretty much all of these. Prescient in so very many ways, here we gotta pick Michael Mann's Heat. just barely enough action sequences to even deserve consideration as an action film, which should tell you something about their quality that we're picking it. There's perhaps never been an action movie that felt as much like a documentary once the guns came out. Only Zero Dark Thirty and Sicario come close. Planned, choreographed, and trained intensively by Special Forces soldiers, never has the sound, blocking, photography, and intensity of an action sequence been so deeply felt. But we also think a lot of credit is due to the exceptional acting of Kilmer De Niro. Pacino and Sizemore, bringing in performances that really exemplify the terror, adrenaline, mania, and stakes that finding yourself in a real life, not a movie honest to God firefight would actually bring. They are professional but not superhuman, disciplined under pressure but not calm. You get to see them battling within themselves to keep their emotions under control in order to function, creating this multi layered nuance of a jaw clenched, spring coiled internal tension. Compare that to the typical action hero who is either uber cool, roaring loudly, or indicating their fear, and you see why the attention to detail really pays off. 
Lastly, we want to look at a newer trend that's starting to be commonplace enough to be worth putting a finger on. Reductively, we'd call this the hyper-violent action film, fitting in complicatedly alongside our last two slots, sometimes seeming to delight in the sadism of extra-gratuitous violence, sometimes seeming to condemn it with how uncomfortable it makes us feel. It is realistic in the sense that it looks unflinchingly at the worst consequences of violence, even though its frequency is seriously heightened. It is over the top in the quantity and gratuity of the gore we see on screen, but the results aren't diffused with humor and moral victory like you'd expect in your typical blockbuster. Its excess is in blood and guts, not explosions and bullets. You hear every bone crack, and that's relatively new. Some of the best films in this last niche are those like Old Boy, Brawl in Cell Block 99, A Prayer Before Dawn, Bone Tomahawk, Green Room, Ichi the Killer, 13 Assassins, and Super. We can trace these films' roots back to two separate but important influences. The transgressive sadism of dark Japanese action that began way back with Sword of Doom and then resurfaced bigger and badder on the global stage in Battle Royale, and the extra-lethal martial arts dynamo of newer Southeast Asian styles, first breaking out in Ong Bak, continuing to this day in The Night Comes For Us, and reaching its apex in our last pick, The Raid Redemption. The Raid hit action cinema like a dump truck, exploding onto the global scene with the rampage ferocity of a rabid bulldog, serving up blood-curdlingly vicious action nearly from go. It trades in mostly all its plot, character, backstory, and theme for one thing and one thing only action. And here, Gareth Evans and his Indonesian stunt team are absolutely first-rate. But when all you're doing is fighting for two hours straight, you have to be more than good at it. You have to be constantly innovating. So the raid sets about exploring all the different ways to hurt, hardly shying away from the blood-drenched corporeality of it all, but to turn to the next murder. And come climax time, when it's time to turn things up yet another notch, the pain and maiming these ruthless men inflict upon each other surpasses all normal decorum. And that's what's so special and to some, a little concerned about this new style. It reaches beyond the polite, sanitized violence we seem to have all agreed is acceptable into a realm usually reserved for horror. But this is action. These are modern gladiators, and we're not here to judge the moral consequences of it all. We just pick the ones that do what they do best, and The Raid is certainly among them, which is why we think it's one of the best action films of all.